A Matter of Faith is about a young woman named Rachel who comes from a creationist household going off to college and experiencing the college life like parties, studying, and the exposure to different ideas that her parents likely kept from her. This sparks her father, Stephen, to debate her biology teacher, Professor Kamen, on evolution. Said debate is filled to the brim with lies and other nonsense which you'd expect from a propaganda movie like this. Let's have a look at it, shall we? The debate is, uh, about as awful as you'd think. Strap in, folks. I'm about to go in hard and dry because lube is for cowards. It seems that when the question is posed as to how life came to exist on our planet, the theory of evolution has become the, the dominant scientific view that is taught in our schools and universities across this great land of ours. We just couldn't start off with anything remotely true, could we? Abiogenesis is currently a hypothesis of the formation of organic compounds and how that led to the formation of life, the processes of which are entirely different from evolution, which is the origin of species, an explanation of how life diversifies. They are not the same thing. If God did not create the universe, then who or what did? Once again, this has nothing to do with the diversification of life. This is that retarded six concepts of evolution nonsense that Jack Chick and Kent Hovind lie about all the time. It's a complete non sequitur. And as for who created the universe, it's possible that the universe is eternal, going through multiple expansions and contractions potentially. To my understanding, however, we don't have definitive answers to everything and don't claim to have them. It's called being honest, something this movie has a hard time doing. Stephen goes on not talking about evolution and then says this. The evolutionary worldview is clearly as much a religion as any theistic worldview. I mean, if you consistently lie about what it is, then I guess you can make that equivocation fallacy look less dishonest, but it doesn't make it true. But please, where in the theory of evolution do people worship some form of supernatural entity? Where are the rituals? What part comments on what happens after we die? Because there is none that is stated or implied. But it is an undermining assault against the authority of God, which really becomes the main issue here. Literally isn't since it makes no comment on the existence of God, but you do you. Stephen finally finishes his inane ramblings and it's Cayman's turn. Ironically enough, it's better but still filled with the same dishonest phrasing and lumping of unrelated explanations together. That living organisms evolved from non-living chemicals and- However, this bit right here is where the Cristiano brothers show their hand. And through a process of descent with modification- This is actually a correct definition of evolution. They know what it is, but continue to state what it isn't. It shows that professional creationists, the ones whose careers rely on taking advantage of the uninformed, still can't lie very effectively. That is proof, Mr. Whitaker. That is scientific proof. Scientific proof is not a thing. You have strong evidence suggesting one possibility over another, but you can never have proof, because a better explanation can always come along. Proof is found in math. But besides the tisms, his opening statement isn't the worst thing, it's terrible, but by this movie's subterranean standards, it's leaps above what I thought it would be. Already we're off to a pretty terrible start, but it gets worse. You see, the examination portion of the debate turns into a philosophical discussion on whether God exists or not. How do you explain away God? Explain away? Simply put, man created God. So. God existing is irrelevant to if evolution is true. God could exist, and evolution would still be a fact. This non sequitur continues until Stephen tags in the former biology professor that came and got fired for teaching creationism. I question why this is allowed or why Kamen wouldn't protest this, but sure. Of course you're going to agree with Freud's views on God, since evolution leaves no room for a supernatural creator. Incorrect. Most Christians believe that God created all the organisms on Earth through evolution, but I guess they're not real Christians. Those experiments only showed that certain organic compounds could be formed from inorganic compounds. I'm assuming this is referencing the Miller-Urey experiments, which demonstrated that amino acids can form naturally under the conditions of the prebiotic Earth. If amino acids can form naturally, then it's possible that peptides could form naturally. 
and the peptides could form naturally, it's possible that RNA nucleotides could form naturally, and so on. I can see why they don't specify the name of the experiments, because any basic research would ruin this film's message. And you know that the amount of information contained in the nucleus of a living cell shows that it could not have evolved from non-living chemicals, and that it must have been created. That's a massive assumption accompanied with our good old friend irreducible complexity, which is just personal incredulity with extra steps. Just because you can't understand how a nucleus could form through natural processes doesn't mean it couldn't have, nor doesn't mean it was conjured into existence by magic. Fallacies are not arguments. You know, the fossil record does not show the continuous development of one kind of creature into another. The amount of transitional species that have been found since Darwin published his theory is so staggering that you would either have to be stupid, a liar, or both to make this claim. Turtles? We got them. Whales? Here you go. Mammals? It's unreal how many we have. Birds? Two years after Darwin published his theory and many more afterwards. Sirenians? Pretty much complete. Tetrapods? The results speak for themselves. Snakes? They don't talk, but we got them. Horses? See for yourself. Humans? We have so many it's hard to tell which goes where at times. There are thousands of transitional species. Most of them, no one in the making of this film would even know about. And that no one has ever seen one kind of plant or animal changing into another of a different kind. Dogs change into different kinds of dogs, but they are always dogs. But they never turn into cats. This is one of the most frustrating straw men that creationists constantly repeat. Not only is that not what evolution says would happen, it would disprove evolution if it were to happen. All descendant groups are still whatever their ancestors were. Dogs turning into cats is an impossibility because felids, and by extension feloids, are an entirely different group of carnivoran that diverged early in the clade's history. This is the law of monophyly. You cannot outgrow your ancestry. You will never be something your predecessors weren't. No matter how far we go along in the time scale, no matter how different an organism will look, no matter what environment it might adapt to, it will always be whatever its ancestors were. No exceptions. And you know that there are layers of assumptions used to calculate the age of the Earth using radiometric dating. So why are you misleading our audience? Okay, so I'm not very good at physics or explaining physics, so I'm going to play a clip of someone who is explaining how we know radiometric dating is accurate. If Steven can tag someone in, then so can I. Now, the ability for radioactive decay rates to be accurately predicted by quantum physics is important because before anyone even enters a laboratory to empirically measure decay rates, it's already possible to know what the decay rate for a particular radioisotope is going to be just by knowing certain things about that isotope, like its atomic number, and fundamental constants like the charge of electrons. So here's my first challenge to creationists. If radiometric dating is unreliable, then why are we able to calculate the decay rates of radioisotopes from first principles in fundamental physics? The same physics that makes predictions that have been validated to 10 decimal places, the same physics that's responsible for the existence of digital technology, and thus the world we live in today, is the exact same physics that tells us that when the building blocks of nature are organized into atoms with such and such properties, they're going to take such and such amount of time to decay. And then those predictions end up agreeing spectacularly with measurement, leading us to conclude that the Earth is billions of years old. Published results consistently converge on the same conclusions using different methods over and over and over again. Uh, for example, the geologist uh, Gary Dalrymple made the table on the left, summarizing the results from research he led in 1993, when he sent tektite samples to different laboratories in Australia, Canada, France, and California. These facilities independently radiometrically dated the samples via a variety of techniques, including argon-argon, potassium-argon, rubidium-strontium, and uranium-lead. Uh, the results, as summarized by the table, clearly converge upon the same tight spread of values on the order of about 65 million years. And you can find a bunch of other tables throughout the geochronological literature like this, 
The table on the right is another one by Dalrymple, this time summarizing his 1991 paper in which chondrite meteorites were independently dated at laboratories in Germany, the UK, France, California, Minnesota, Missouri, and Denver, and with a bunch of different techniques um, that once again converge on the same result, this time of about four and a half billion years. These kinds of tables also exist for cross comparisons between radiometric dating and other techniques including tree ring dating, ice core dating, and various types of luminescence dating. You get the picture. So here's my second challenge to creationists. If radiometric dating is unreliable, then why do scientific publications consistently report the same results across different techniques, labs, and even decades? Here's a table published by Bouvier et al. Um, 15 years after Dalrymple's chondrite publication, where they dated a bunch of different chondrites from all around the globe, and their results still match Dalrymple's from the previous decade. Basically, the consistency of radiometric dating across different methods, and the fact that we can use fundamental knowledge of physics to use it accurately, makes this initial statement all the more dishonest. The Earth is not billions of years old. The Earth is not millions of years old, not even close. If the Earth is only a few thousand years old, you have a lot of problems you need to solve first. One of which being the heat problem. Something you get when you try and put 4 billion years worth of radioactive decay in the year of Noah's flood. What would happen if you crammed 4.5 billion years of nuclear decay, or even 500 million years worth of nuclear decay, into one year? Well, nuclear decay releases heat and radiation, so accelerating nuclear decay results in lethal conditions to a comically insane degree. Friend of the channel, Jordan of the Reasons to Doubt podcast, helped me drum up some math. By taking the heat output today and applying it back in time, we end up with 1.68 times 10 raised 30 joules of energy for major nuclear decay chains over the past 4.5 billion years. This is equivalent to 4.01 times 10 raised 14 1 megaton hydrogen bombs. This means every cubic kilometer gets its own 402 hydrogen bombs, and every square kilometer gets its own 787,884 hydrogen bombs. Some creationists like to take the majority of that 4.5 billion years worth of accelerated nuclear decay and stick it into the creation week on like day three before God creates any living things. So God makes the planet, accelerates the nuclear decay, artificially aging the Earth, and then sticks all the living things on that planet. Of course, they can only take this so far because they do propose that the Flood is responsible for at least 500 million years worth of the geologic column. So in that case, the most that they can stick into the creation week is about 4 billion years, leaving 500 million years worth of accelerated nuclear decay for the Flood. So how much heat do you get from just 500 million years worth of accelerated nuclear decay. We just have to take one ninth of our initial number. 500 million years worth of decay is 1.86 times 10 raised 29 joules and equivalent to 4.45 times 10 raised 13 hydrogen bombs. This is equivalent to 87,237 H-bombs per square kilometer. To put it another way, University of Florida geologist Joe Muir did his own math and showed that the thermal gradient, if you start accelerated nuclear decay at creation, you end up with an immediate 65,000 degrees Celsius per kilometer which cools to a nice 40,000 degrees Celsius per kilometer by the time Noah's flood occurs, and 400 degrees Celsius per kilometer by Jesus' birth. This is 13 to 14 times hotter than the surface of the sun. I'll link these videos below so you can watch them both in full. To me, the most troubling aspect about this issue is that in our society today, evolution is being taught in our schools and universities across this land as a matter of fact. Because it is a fact. One that the writers of this film have no understanding of, and I don't think want to understand it. But no one can scientifically prove evolution. Like I said before, you can't prove anything in science, but you can show an overwhelming amount of evidence for something, which evolution has in spades. The entirety of agriculture cannot happen if evolution isn't a fact. The debate at this point devolves into more false equivocations, false dichotomies, and the usual creationist nonsense. This video was not directed at Christians as a whole. I know most Christians aren't like this and they accept evolution for the fact that it is. 
while I may disagree on the idea of God being responsible, I'm not going to insult anyone for it. And I genuinely feel bad for Christians as these movies paint them in a horrible light. I probably won't tackle more of these, however, unless I find one that's really bad and talks about similar subjects to this one. So, no, God's not dead. Sorry. It was kind of nice shaking things up a bit, though. If you've stuck around for this long, thank you. Next time will be business as usual.